Okay, here we go. Um, let's understand our own safety data. So I think that these numbers are a bit dangerous that I've already shown you because they talk about what they do and what they do doesn't necessarily mean anything to what I do, right? Oh, I'm different, <laughs> you know? If you go home and you say, boss, this is, we're bad, look at all this. We're, we're number one. I don't know, well, we're not number one, you know? Well, okay, so let's find out what we do. Not my data, my plan's not like that. And averages don't mean anything to me, right? All right. So, um, a few of my heroes. Peter Drucker, I read his book, The Effective Executive, every year. It's a little thin paperback book, I recommend it. But one of the things he says is what gets measured gets managed, right? If it's a metric that is visible to executives and plant managers, if they're held accountable for it, they're gonna do something about it. When that number moves around, people talk, there's a target, you're not meeting a target, starts influencing stuff, okay? So we've gotta make safety that way. I don't know, is it true in your facilities that everybody, both operators, supervisors, managers, the big dog that sits on his butt all day, all of those people know where we are on TCIR, LCIR, DART, all that stuff. Do they know? Do they know when we had the last injury and what it was about and what we're doing about it? Hmm. Sometimes that's true, sometimes maybe not. Would it be helpful if we made those metrics visible about our facility, our factory, so that people had a sense that A, we cared, what those numbers were, and B, we were trying to do something about it. You probably post numbers about productivity. You might even post numbers about quality. If safety is truly a priority over those two things, those numbers should be more visible, more talked about, first talked about than the other two numbers. My company's not perfect. It's half of the average, by the way, a foundry, an aluminum foundry, okay? We're running about 1.8 on our TCIR, okay? That's, that's small compared to where the average is, about 3.9 right now, okay? And what do we do? Every meeting begins with safety because every human being who's a boss has a responsibility for safety of their area. So the production business unit manager in the production meeting in the morning, he stands up and the first thing he says is, zero injuries or incidents. At least we hope that's what he says. If he says he has one, we had one incident. And then he repeats the basic issue. You know, Ralph fell, sprained his wrist. He's gotta say that for a month until that month's cleaned off. And if he has two, he's got to recount two. That's rare, happily, but. Because it's a priority. Then the next thing they talk about is quality. And then the final thing they talk about is productivity. Okay, and then they're done, because that's what matters. Okay. You can follow that example or not. Face reality as it is, not as it was, or as you wish it to be, that means we really do need to look at our own numbers, right? All right, enough sermonizing. So, <clears throat> what we choose to measure and manage is what our people think is important to us. It is certainly what we focus on because these are indicators of our health and performance. And now we have an opportunity to hold people accountable for numbers. And, and there are some people who have this feeling that it is unfair to hold a supervisor accountable or a plant manager accountable for their injury rate. Like downgrading them if they had a high injury rate is a bad thing. What, what do they have to do with that? Everything. Okay? 
Oh, you had more clumsy people, so we're not going to hold you accountable. What is that thinking? That thinking is the worker is the person who's responsible for his own safety, not the guy that built the whole stinking factory around them, gave them their tools, gave them their time, gave them their training, told them how to do the job, and made them do it for 8 or 10 or 12 hours in a row. That guy's not responsible for what happens on the floor? You definitely need to hold people accountable for their safety. And it should be a part of their performance appraisal. Because they are entrusted with people. That's your valued asset. That's what makes you money. And if people are unhappy, or if people are doing things that are unsafe, or they're doing things that hurt them, that is not good for money, let alone the human compassionate side of you. Yeah. Make people accountable for safety. Now, immediately they'll be frustrated because they might not know what to do to make that number go down. That's why we have training. But we're going to talk about what kind of an environment a plant manager should establish in order to have good performance. And that's their responsibility, is to establish a culture that puts priority on safety. And then they can assign resources, allocate responsibilities, and take concrete actions to put their personal presence and their decision making in favor of safety to address that metric. And when they do that, other things will also improve. When we measure stuff, we give people a language to talk about it, and that's useful, right? If we want to place a priority on safety, we got to talk about it, which means we got to have a, langu a language to use about it. And it gives us an opportunity to do some consistent reporting. It allows us to analyze causes and uh, just prevents Hiding promotes openness. I like Dilbert. Occasionally you'll see a cartoon in here. Okay. The basic principle of any improvement, in fact, so I said, I, I think it's 39 years this year. I've been 39 years in quality. So somebody asked me at a conference recently, so, Shorn, you got all these years of experience. So, put quality improvement into, you know, like 30 second sound bite. So, uh, that's a challenging thing to do. But I said, I'll take you on. And in fact, I'll make it one more. Here's the basic principle of any improvement in any field it's plan, do, check, act. What does that mean? First, you figure out what you want to do before you start doing it. Oh, well, that, that's a good idea, right? Set targets, figure out a direction, figure out what's important. That's planning. Now, people that only plan, they're dreamers. They're, they're, they may have a use somewhere, but not in manufacturing. Okay? So after you plan, then you execute, right? You communicate those plans as clearly as possible with priority, and you have people do stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but I had kids when I grew up, and they didn't always do what I told them to do, and it didn't always work out the way I wanted it to. So the next step is to check, to find out how it went, whether the results matched what we planned to have them be. And the story of so much failed improvement effort in every area is to plan, do, check, and stop. I don't know, we, we, in my business, we got a lot of check sheets on the shop floor. We check how things are going. Anybody look at those check sheets, do anything with them? If you don't, pretty soon people are going to know they're just paper and don't mean anything and they're going to fill them out however they want to because they know nobody's looking at them. But when you check and you actually do something about it, that's a big deal. I was a high school teacher. I followed plan, do, check, act. Okay, I taught physics. What did I do? I made a lesson plan. I taught the class. 
And what did I do to check? I gave homework. I gave tests. And it mattered. Okay? Why did it matter? Not just because the kid got a grade. It mattered because the check is on me. If everybody flunks my test, do you think I'm supposed to say, those guys are just stupid? No, I'm a crappy teacher. I did not do a very good job of either executing or planning. If everybody fails to test, I'm a crappy teacher. By the way, that's a heretical idea in education today. But that's a sidebar. So, we plan, we do, we check, and then we're supposed to take action. What, in, in the high school environment, I, I went over the homework. I made sure everybody understood what was going on. If I noticed the question five, everybody got wrong, I scratch my head and figure out what was wrong in question five. I might even subtract that from everybody's grades so that they're not hurt by that because that was on me. You know? Well, in a manufacturing environment, we establish plans. We tell people how they're supposed to do their work. They go out and do it as best they can. They want to please you. They want to please their supervisors. They want to make money. They want to go home at the end of the day feeling like they did a good job. And we check on the work. We have PDI inspections and all kinds of other checks to make sure that the unit was produced correctly. Then, if we don't do anything about those inspection results, we're stupid, we're wasting money. We gotta feed that back so that people have learned something about how it went, so that we can alter something, so we can change something. And maybe it turned out Lo and behold, that we got better results than we expected. Well, now we really want to investigate so we can repeat that occurrence, that miraculous occurrence, and make sure it happens all the time. But, so that's how we improve. Same with safety. We plan operations so people won't get hurt, right? I mean, we don't plan any that they would deliberately get hurt. So they're working. Somebody gets hurt, we have to check. We have to find out what's going on about that. We have to do incident investigation. And then we take action and we improve that process. We improve that operation to the point where it doesn't happen again or the severity is reduced or the occurrence rate is reduced significantly. That's how we improve anything, everything, but safety certainly. Okay, so for you, maybe your safety director, maybe you want to be personally involved as plant manager or some corporate head, but you want to collect your own data. In the same topography, the same category breakdown as OSHA does and as uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics does. Body part, process, uh, our uh, nature, source, event. Those are the four standard classifications. And you can take your own 300 log and you can break them down into those categories. And you can copy the category names off the graphs that I just gave you if you want to use those. Those are the standard categories that OSHA uses. But I'd also dig a little deeper and investigate by process, what process has the most injuries. And if you've got enough data, you might break that further down into what kind of injury. By shift, if you run a multi-shift operation, I don't know, did, is that not common? Most people work just days in this industry, is that right? So maybe that's not such a big deal. Um, and then by plant or product type. Compare the rates to our industry benchmarks. If you're way different, if your charts look very different, if you've got some unusual industry, uh, injury, maybe you've got a lot of burns or something, well, what's up with that? What's going, what, what process is driving that? Where is that coming from? That's not usual for trailer industry. So we want to investigate that. I recommend particularly if you're in a blessed condition where you don't have a lot of uh, recordable injury data, 
I would encourage you to include first aid data. You say, I don't have any first aid data. When they get first aid, they don't tell us. Well, that's something that we could start, right? It is not true that a first aid, you know, so many first aids means a recordable, you know, it, there's some early work done in safety that kind of thought that. That's not really true. But you probably recognize that an inch over on a cut that only needs a Band-Aid probably would have been a recordable injury where he would have got stitches, okay? Just an inch over. Near misses and first aids are injuries that only by luck didn't turn into something that you had to write down in your 300 log. So that means the causes of first aid injuries are frequently helpful information to drive a more complete, more comprehensive look at data and have, you know, help you fill out your charts so that there's some, some data to work with to see where the, the issues are in your facility. So if you don't collect first aid data, that's something that you can do. And by the way, when you initiate that effort, you're going to surprise a few people. You mean, if I cut myself and just take a bandage out of the first aid cabinet, you want me to tell you? Yeah. Well, why is that? Because I care about you. And while that scratch may not be a big deal to you, it could have been a lot worse, and I want to prevent that. Oh, really? Well, I just snagged my hand on that nail. Well, that nail shouldn't have been sticking out, and your hand probably shouldn't have been there. And, you know, maybe we got to have you wear gloves or something, but, Ralph, I care about you. And so I want to hear about first aid. That might, that might go a long way towards improving your communication with people. I don't know about you, but my mama wanted to know about me when I used first aid. Sometimes it was because I was doing something I wasn't supposed to, right? But sometimes it was just because she cared about me. You don't have to be a mama for your employees, but you do have to demonstrate that you care and Taking care of people and demonstrating some personal connection is the first step to having trust. And you can't operate a business without a degree of trust. Okay. So, doing a little arithmetic, gathering information, breaking it down, and then comparing it to industry benchmarks, that's what we want to encourage you to do for your own facility. Okay. Make that visible to decision makers and people that have the ability to allocate resources. <clears throat> Use a lot of data, okay? This, unfortunately, injury data is attribute. It's a count. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. That's information poor kind of data. You need a lot of that kind of data in order to establish trends and to have a degree of confidence in your decision making. So I recommend that you not only collect one year's worth of data, but maybe you go back two or three years. Your processes are probably not that different two years ago, even three years ago than they are today. They may have improved in some small fashion, but what you ask the human being to do may be fairly similar. And if it is, accumulating that data together will give you a more holistic picture of what's going on and kind of populate those charts. Another thing to do with your two or three years worth of data is to look at your own trend. Are you getting better or getting worse? Where are you getting better or getting worse? And I'm not talking about Ralph's plant versus Sam's plant versus Sally's plant. I'm also talking about this particular operation, whether it's a lamination operation or some cutting operation or a plumbing connection operation. What, what is it? Is that getting better or getting worse? And then, since you have probably, but certainly you were asked to collect the data for your OSHA log, you can connect that data to your own demographics. Is it the more senior people that are getting hurt, or is it the young guys? 
in your facility. You saw what the overall numbers were, but how is it in your place? Oh, we just brought in 50 new guys because we populated a plant and we got a lot of injuries over there. Well, okay, so what are we gonna do about that? <laughs> you know, let's, let's dive down to a place where it becomes actionable so we see what drove those numbers so that we can do something about it. If you don't do that, then if you don't take the long-term view and the holistic view, you end up operating on the basis of crisis management. The, the classic allegory that works in quality and it certainly works in safety is the guys that are out, they're, they're supposed to build a factory and the land is kind of swampy and so they've got to drain the swamp. And uh, so their job is to drain the swamp, right? The problem is there's alligators. And so they get focused on shooting the alligators because it's kind of hard to drain the swamp when you're getting bit in the butt by an alligator. So pretty soon the focus is shooting alligators. And by the way, that's a very glorious occupation. Crisis managers get a lot of good press. They're the ones that get the bonus. They're the ones that get called up to the upper office and get an attaboy. But the guys that are working in the trenches draining the swamp, they don't get a lot of glory. Not a very sexy occupation. Unfortunately, improving safety is not a very sexy occupation. It's a long-term thing. You're not a fireman, you're an insurance salesman. And, and by the way, us quality guys and safety guys, we're buds, best buds. Why? Because we have a lot in common, right? We're the guys saying we gotta prevent things. Yeah, we're the ones that step in when there's a quality problem and the customer's ticked off, and we're the guys that step in when somebody's bleeding on the floor. And that's a glorious role, maybe. Certainly everybody knows about it. But doing the behind the scenes work to prevent, that's based on numbers, that's based on taking actions that aren't very glorious but are absolutely necessary, and that's where you want to be. I don't know about you, but I like to have boring days. No big trouble. Just turning the crank on the money machine, right?